Mental health in all kinds of media is becoming quite popular, with movies, TV shows and games wanting to depict certain mental illnesses or conditions in order to normalise them and increase awareness. It can be hard to depict the negative side of mental health in games without slipping into the horror genre due to how dark and bleak conditions like depression can be. I've seen several lists online talking about mental health depictions in games, usually with Hellblade Senua's sacrifice being at the number one spot, deservedly. But I wanted to look at lesser known indie games, games that may not have had as much exposure, with smaller budgets and smaller studios. Some games like to use symbolism to suggest certain aspects of mental health issues, which can sometimes get lost on an audience. I wanted to find games that straight up say what they're trying to convey, to take a player into the real world of someone suffering from mental illness. I found two games that did this well, and both could go under the radar of any gamer. The first was called Indigo, a point and click game set in a single room of a painter struggling with his depression. The menu includes a section that talks about what depression is, how to spot it in yourself or loved ones, and even the best way to communicate to someone with depression. If more people knew any part of what was written on these eight small pages, I honestly believe the compassion would save lives. On top of the basic outline, when you start a new game, there's a disclaimer making sure whoever goes into this game will take care of their mental well-being, suggesting playing the game during the day or in the company of a trusted person. This mandatory screen shows that the developers were not aiming to create a game for entertainment or shock value. They truly want to make sure every player is aware of what the game entails and not to push themselves if they feel they can't. There is no pressure to play or enjoy the game, and it was created to show people what depression can feel like. The main character is Tom, an artist who has locked himself away from the world, and Anne, his girlfriend, who's trying her best to understand and take care of him. The journal entries show Tom's struggle with his mind and the guilt of involving Anne in his pain. As someone who's suffered from depression for many, many years, the art style immediately clicked with me and felt familiar. Depression can suck all the light and colour out of a person's life. Objects seem to meld into the shelf they're placed on, and scattered papers on the floor just become part of the room. Everything can look like a painting. Details lost in the overall picture, but every item exactly where it should be. Some people think this is a gross over-exaggeration, but those who have experienced depression and been at their lowest point will recognise some part of this room as a place they've lived. The music is gentle and loops over and over throughout the game. It's sad and slow, almost struggling to keep constant tempo, heightening the atmosphere within the room. This can show how repetitive and dull life can feel when a person experiences a deep depression. Every day feels the same, and time begins to drag. Anne leaves letters for Tom, and seeing Anne's thoughts and feelings can be upsetting. She doesn't completely understand what he's going through, and is both worried and frustrated. She continues to make excuses for his absences to friends, and brings him meals every day while checking up on him. She's almost hostile in her letters, but it's always aimed at the depression, not Tom, and how all she wants is to help him through this. This behaviour may be familiar to people who haven't suffered from mental illness, not knowing what to say or how to act, and carrying a certain amount of shame by hiding the truth from other people. 
This isn't a criticism from neither myself nor the game, but an honest look at loved ones on the outside looking in. Anger can feel misplaced, and in some of Tom's responses, he feels the need to put himself down to justify her emotions. Not all responses are available depending on which actions you decide to take during the playthrough. Looking through Tom's stuff, like a box of old sketches, we can almost see his sadness growing through his art. Portraits turn from happy faces to depictions of demons, or controlled lines to ink blotches and scratches. In my first playthrough, I picked the more negative, hopeless responses and engaged in the more harmful activities such as smoking and drinking. Each choice will change the direction of the story. The letters from Anne either becoming hopeful or more distressed, and Tom's response choices becoming singular. There are minor changes in the room with each day that passes, and small tasks related to the letters that Tom has to complete or avoid. By the end of my first playthrough, I wholeheartedly understood Tom. I knew exactly how he felt, how he looked, how much he slept all day and stayed up all night overthinking, how much he cried without obvious reason. One letter from Anne shows how far she had pushed herself to help Tom, and how scared she was for him. She talks about what she sees when she brings him his meals. An unmade bed, untidy room, rubbish everywhere, hearing Tom in the bathroom or seeing him pretend to be asleep. She's happy to see all of that, as long as she never sees anything else. As long as his suffering goes no further than that. The first ending I got, Tom resigned himself to just giving up and feeling like things will never get better. The second ending, however, I made enough positive decisions that Tom was able to leave his room and was encouraged to try and move forward with his life. He likens life to being on a raft in a rough sea, and now he just wants to learn to build a stronger boat. I do love this metaphor, and I've heard it many times in the past. There's no way to change how life treats us, nor is there a way to avoid all the bad times we may experience. Just like life, the sea is unpredictable, so the best thing we can do is build a stronger boat and learn to ride the waves. Drowning is a story of a teenage boy who begins feeling depressed during his high school years. We stroll through the landscapes and the story is written out sentence by sentence, popping up in front of us as we walk. The music and sound effects that accompany the story are soothing at first. Birds tweeting, the rustle of grass moving in the breeze, Then, gentle piano music begins. The landscape is actually important for setting the mood of the story as we read it. We can go from a straight, flat path to a sudden slope or steep hill. The trees feel taller and more crowded at points, almost creating a sense of claustrophobia from the depression approaching. The juxtaposition of the sunny day in nature and the words on the screen did confuse my interpretation at first. 
Was this done on purpose to show how the outside does not always reflect the inside? Was the sincerity of mental health being lightened with pretty colours to make it more palatable? I suppose it's up to the player to decide how they translate the visuals, which can lead to creativity or criticism. The teen describes depression in such open terms that at first you think he's talking about a person, someone he slowly got to know at school, but also someone who isolated him from his other friends and family. Some might think the story or movement is far too slow to be engaging, but that's how mental illness is sometimes. It can be a gradual thing that sneaks up on you after months or years of negative experiences, causing a decline in mental health that may not be obvious at first. I do understand wanting things to move along a little faster though, as I wanted to know what would happen in the story, and I usually read quite quickly. After each year, the landscape changes and we go deeper into this teen's descent into depression. We learn the things he's been going through, how his thinking is being affected, how he's so quick to blame himself. People who have experienced depression may recognise this journey and can relate to how he's feeling. As someone who's been through this multiple times, I felt like begging him to talk to someone and how so many of his intrusive thoughts weren't true. How his depression puts a false layer of negativity over everything and anything. In year 10, the scenery changes from day to night and from a forest to a beach setting. This could be seen as relaxing and peaceful, or that the sun is setting on his happiness. It leads on to a never-ending wooden bridge in what looks like a misty canyon in the following year. Some planks are missing or misplaced. There are no guardrails and the mist covers not only the path in front of us, but also the drop from the bridge itself. Year 12 is nearly pitch black, with the landscape only being visible a few feet in front of us. We can't see where we're going and are only led by the text that pops up telling the story. And the music is minimal, tunnel vision, isolation, darkness, uncertainty, trusting only the words he tells himself regardless if there's any truth in them. Year 13 has no soundtrack. Only crickets chirping and an empty hum of silence behind it. He's walking through a dense forest at night, his words now glowing in the darkness. You can almost feel the hopelessness and anger of thinking there's no way to change things, that there's only one way out. The 
A solitary cabin sitting in the middle of the path does manifest feelings of dread and fear. And once inside, those feelings are vindicated. I didn't expect the final level, as the previous one seemed pretty conclusive. But here we are, walking down a misty path in silence. Suddenly the piano starts up once again. This final level didn't resonate with me at all. Not everyone comes to terms with their mental illness. Their depression doesn't always speak so kindly and justify the pain. Sometimes there is no light bulb moment and we need others to help us get out of the hole we're in. Personally, finding someone on the outside looking in really helped me understand why I fell in the first place and what continued to feed my depression. I understand the need for a happy ending when dealing with a story about mental health, but it didn't feel true to reality, in my opinion and experience, of course. And as the teen comes to terms with his depression, we go through a blue portal. Throughout the story, there were some sentences that stood out to me, and I remember hearing and thinking them in the past. Some made perfect, logical sense at the time, and shows how damaged depressive thinking can be.
Indigo and Drowning are very different in their presentation, with Indigo using its art style to help visualise depression as an extra layer on top of the writing. Drowning shows the drip feeding of negativity that can occur during depression and the slow realisation of what is happening. Games like these are important tools to show people the reality of living with mental illnesses. They are a controlled and moderated way to experience the thoughts and feelings of a person who feels hopeless and isolated. Sometimes with mental illness there is just one room involved. Or it takes its time creeping up on you. Sometimes there is no dramatic crying in the rain like you see in movies. There's no feeling sad. There's nothing. Like static on a radio, there's sound, but it's just noise. The biggest takeaway from Indigo and Drowning is that mental health can feel very lonely. Like you're the only person feeling that way. These games show that no one is alone. There are people who understand how and why these thoughts appear and want to help. Understanding mental illnesses from any position is beneficial and the importance of asking for or offering support can make a huge impact on healing and introduce a little light into someone's darkness. <laughs> 